Welcome to the first of our spring 2019 webinars for high tunnel producers. I'm Cheryl Burns, uh, the project and outreach manager with Capital RC&D, and I'll be the moderator for the webinar this morning. I'm pleased to introduce Francesco De Gioia, Assistant Professor of Vegetable Crop Science at Penn State University, who's going to talk with us about using anaerobic soil disinfestation in high tunnels. This morning is the first of two sessions, with the follow-up and more advanced session occurring next Tuesday on April 9th at the same time. Funding for this webinar series is provided by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, who has funding and technical support available for eligible applicants that can be used to purchase high tunnels. I'll provide a link and follow-up materials and a survey uh, for the webinar um, so that anybody that's interested in learning more about uh, the high tunnel program or an other NRCS programs can find that information or access to their local service center, as well as to provide feedback about the, the webinar, um, both for Francisco and for Capital RC&D. So with that, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Francesco De Gioia and thank him for joining us. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Cheryl, for your uh, introduction. Um, so this morning, we are going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what is anaerobic soil disinfestation and uh, its principle, how it can be applied. And um, next time in the next section, we will go more uh, in depth into um, some of the aspect of, uh, of uh, the application of anaerobic soil disinfestation. Um, before I, I start, I, I would like to um, acknowledge uh, the fact that um, the, 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 this presentation and the work I have been doing in the last uh, four years uh, with anaerobic soil disinfestation were done uh, within the framework, are, are, are being done within the framework of um, a USDA ARS um, project, area-wide project on anaerobic soil disinfestation, which is uh, led by uh, Dr. Aaron Roscoff from uh, the USDA ARS um, in Fort Pierce, Florida. And um, this project is uh, uh, like uh, is a is a large project that involves uh, several partners from the USDA ARS uh, that are listed here. Um, and also uh, partners from the University of Florida. Uh, and um, I, I just started this year here working at Penn State uh, 10 months ago. And then I believe there are also partners from the University of uh, Tennessee. And so I really would like to thank all the, the people that uh, taught me a lot about anaerobic soil disinfestation and that are doing um, and continue to do um, uh, a lot of great work on this technique, developing um, the, 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 the the core science behind it, and also taking this to uh, transfer this technology to the growers. So this has been uh, our main effort in all these years, and um, hopefully um, uh, we we can serve bet well, um, you know, all uh, the high tunnel uh, community. Um, growers. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I would like to start saying that um, high tunnel production systems are increasingly used, especially in the northeast of the United States. And uh, the reason for that is because um, these are really flexible tools that allow an extension of uh, the growing season. Uh, but Beside that, allow a better control of the environment. So, for example, we uh, are not subject to uh, rainfall event and to extreme weather. So, it's, it's really an important tool. And there are crops like tomatoes and uh, bell pepper, cucurbits, and strawberry that are really um, <clears throat> um, like getting benefit out of this type of, uh, of, of growing system and um, but we also have to say that uh, this system allows to control uh, much better the quality also of the production so there is a series of advantages that uh, 
make this type of system really attractive. And then also there are, we know that there is a program from the USDA that uh, is, giving, is providing funding to, to growers that want to start um, uh, working in Itano. And um, one thing we have to say is that um, when we work in Itano, this is a completely different uh, system, production system compared to, um, to the open field environment. And so um, there are there are things that we should be aware of. Um, so in general, uh, high tunnel production system are really have peculiar peculiar um, microclimatic condition. And one thing that we can say for sure, while the tunnel is covered, there is no rainfall. And so we create an environment that is like desert-like condition. And um, in general, we have higher temperature, higher relative humidity. Most of the time we have just natural ventilation, uh, but of course we can have also forced uh, ventilation, but most of the time is natural ventilation. And because of the higher temperature, we also have higher soil microbial activity. And so that affects a lot of things. We have higher evapotranspiration, and one aspect, because it doesn't rain, the water that we apply uh, with the irrigation system, because of the evaporation, because of the um, higher temperature, generally <clears throat> move, moves up rather than down. And this may create issues like you know, nutrient accumulation, salt build in the topsoil layer. So these are aspects that we should consider. And then another aspect is that we have higher plant biomass, generally higher fruit production, um, higher uh, water and nutrient requirement. And this allows to extend a little bit the growing season. So starting earlier and finishing later uh, with, with a given crop that we, we may have. And now this is also, usually we are covering only a small area, most small surface. It may be one acre, it may be less than an acre, it may be a few square foot. Um, but in general, high tunnel production system are really intensive year round cropping system. And one issue with this system is that there's limited possibility to implement crop rotation or include cover crops because um, like people are trying to get you know, the maximum out of it. And, and so um, this may, uh, may cause some issues. So for example, um, sometimes uh, growers are, 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 um, are specializing, for example, producing just tomatoes in Aitana because tomatoes provide the highest revenue, there's a good market for it. And, and so uh, it's really, it's really um, attractive for them to work just with one crop. But if we don't manage the soil properly, if we don't do things properly, then after four or five years of continue, um, tomatoes after tomatoes, then we can start having issues. So like you see in this picture here, you have plants that are stunting, that are not moving anywhere, not producing well. And those that you see in this picture, surprisingly enough, they are grafted tomatoes. And so this is, this is kind of uh, impressive. Now, uh, of course, if we don't manage the soil properly, we can have a lot of, um, we can build up inoculum of soil-borne um, pests and, and, and disease issue. Like in this case, you can see uh, tomato wild mold, also known as uh, timber rot, which is caused by uh, Clerotinia sclerosiorum. And um, this is a big issue, for example, in Pennsylvania. And it's partially due to the fact that we are not doing enough rotation, that we are not taking care well of the soil. Uh, here in this picture, you can see also uh, fusarium wilt, tomato fusarium wilt caused by uh, fusarium oxysporum, lycopersis. And you can see this is like another, uh, it's like a vascular disease where you see here this browning. Um, and this is a typical symptom. And um, so these are soil-borne diseases that we can have. Um, Pretty commonly in our eye tunnel. And then uh, lately, uh, going around in Pennsylvania, I'm discovering that uh, even in Pennsylvania, a lot of um, 
especially in Southeast PA, a lot of the growers, uh, the high tunnel growers that are doing tomatoes from a few years, uh, start having issue with nematodes, uh, and particularly with the root knot nematodes. And this is a, a picture of a nematode. This is um, not a root knot nematode, but it's, uh, you know, our soil is full of nematodes and probably this is a beneficial one, but uh, this is how um, uh, roots that are infested by a root knot nematode uh, may look like. So you have these little galls that um, develop on, on the fine roots and then um, the as the, the infestation is higher, we really have this, this um, this level of, 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 of infestation, which is uh, really bad. And, you know, that really affects the, the, the quality of the crop. And, and so when we have situation like this, um, like how do we face those situation? Now, when we talk about um, high tunnel production system, one thing that is really key is the soil and the soil health. And um, so, in this production system, we rely a lot on the soil, on the same soil, maybe for more than a year, and we really need to take care of the soil health. So, uh, what is the soil health? The health of agricultural soil is defined as its capacity as a vital life living system to sustain plant and animal productivity and maintain an environment that can promote plant and animal health. Now, there is different um, different aspect of soil health. We can talk about nutrient. We can talk about uh, a lot of different things. But from a crop health perspective, um, a healthy soil is a disease suppressive soil, which is characterized generally by higher biological diversity, and this provides resilience to stress and lead to relative low relatively low uh, disease incidence so the question is how we can uh, improve our soil health how what are the tools that are available so that we can manage our soil better and reduce the incidence of, of um, soil borne disease um, now thinking at this um, there are conventional solution and there are also biological or non-synthetic solution. Um, in a sustainable production system, the ideal is to combine uh, different of those tools. This is like a toolbox that we have, and uh, depending on the opportunity that we have in our own farm, in our system, we can choose which of those tools are suitable uh, for us. So uh, in the past, we have used a lot chemicals of fumigation, uh, recently, there is also use of chemigations, which is for the application of uh, agrochemicals through the fertigation system. Then um, growers have always used uh, preventing uh, spraying uh, for certain to solve certain issue. But then we have a series of biological or nonsense or non-synthetic uh, solution, non-chemical solution. And among those, the, the first um, the first technique, the first solution that we have is to use varieties that are resistant to, you know, soil borne disease, soil borne pests. Um, at, at the same time, we can use vegetable grafting uh, using resistant rootstock. Um, and then there are practices like that have been used for 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 many years, like crop rotation, uh, the use of cover crops, also organic amendments, and this include also biostimulants, the use of um, uh, microbial uh, solution that uh, are beneficial for our crop. Um, now, in when we talk about high tunnel, some of these uh, solution are not easy to apply because we said we have an intense, uh, intensive production system where it's not easy to do crop rotation. So that's part of the challenge. It's not easy. There is no space for cover crop, or there is limited space for cover crop. Um, Many times we do organic amendments and probably we need to manage organic amendments better so that we don't exceed um, with organic amendments. And organic amendments are usually used to improve the physical properties of the soil, but also to provide fertilizer, to provide nutrients. So it's both physical and chemical properties. 
but there is also a biological component of organic amendment that we should take advantage of. And some of these organic amendments may be used to develop a suppressive um, soil or have been used in the past for that reason. Then we have practices like no tillage, floating. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, is, um, there, there are a lot of growers using steaming uh, when they have soil that is tired, that, is, um, that need to be reset. Um, then there are practices that have been used all over the world, like soil solarization, biosolarization, uh, biofumigation. And for example, soil solarization, a limit of that is that you need um, like the summer uh, to, to work on that and you need a really high um, sunlight um, intensity. Um, but for example, that is a solution that is not optimal for Pennsylvania because over the summer is our growing season. The summer is our growing season. So there is no space really for soil solarization. And something like biosolarization may be uh, something more acceptable. Um, biofumigation with some um, cover crops, let's say mustards or brassicas that uh, produce glucosinolates and isothiocyanate. Uh, this is another technique developed in the past. And then we have anaerobic soil disinfestation. So anaerobic soil disinfestation is one of the tools that we can in implement in our, on our farm and it can be integrated with, with um, some of these uh, other um, biological or non-synthetic um, solution, or even with um, with the conventional solution. So let's go into what is anaerobic soil disinfestation. Uh, it's also known as biological soil disinfestation or reductive soil disinfestation. Uh, these different names were proposed by different scientists while working on it, and we use here in US the term anaerobic soil disinfestation because we think that the main aspect that characterize this technique is the, develop, the development of anaerobic condition and the decomposition of the organic amendment that we apply under anaerobic condition. But this is also a biological uh, treatment because it's driven by uh, microbes in the soil. And so that's why um, some of the scientists call it biological soil disinfestation. And reductive is really, uh, a synonym, a synonym of uh, anaerobic soil disinfestation because we create a reductive soil environment, anaerobic soil environment. So in general, ASD is considered, is, is considered one of the most promising non-synthetic methods for the simultaneous control of soil-borne pathogens, plant parasitic nematodes, and weeds. So there's not that many techniques that are really um, capable of managing, controlling, suppressing simultaneously uh, fungal soil-borne disease, uh, fungal soil-borne pathogen, bacterial soil-borne pathogen, and then also nematodes and weeds. So anaerobic soil disinfestation is promising, especially for this reason. Um, so uh, this was developed, ASD was developed as an alternative to methyl bromide and other soil chemical fumigants, and this was done independently in Japan and in Netherlands. Um, so ASD in the last, um, I will say since 2000, so in the last, we can say almost 20 years, uh, has been uh, studied in different countries, in different places, on different crops, and proven to be effective against several soil-borne disease like fungal and bacterial, also nematodes and weeds. And this was done across different, um, uh, a wide range of crops and environment. So in, in really different conditions and with different um, like uh, specific approach. Now, how, how it was developed? Uh, it is interesting that some of the things are discovered by chance. And um, for example, in Netherlands, in uh, around 1944-45, they had a big flood that lasted basically over a year. And um, what happened in that case was that after that they recovered the land uh, after flooding, uh, the, the growers, they were growing bulbs like these uh, tulips and other, other crops that, um, that are pretty popular in, uh, in, in Netherlands. 
um, they notice that after that flooding, a lot of the con the the, the soilborne disease issue that they had were controlled. Like they didn't have issue anymore for a few years. And so that was um, something that someone started noticing. And, and so then when they start having issue again with nematodes, for example, um, one of the growers start saying, we start thinking about this. And he said, well, maybe um, the floating was the, the what, what really controlled the nematodes before. And so he, he said, we should try this again. And so he, he floated this field and he saw that the floating was able to control nematodes. And, and so now in Netherlands, um, in many areas, nematodes are controlled with floating. And one aspect of this is it requires at least eight, 12 weeks um, of floating. So it's long time, so it's not always possible. And, and of course, not everywhere there is water to do that. So it's a, like, a, I will say a primitive technique, but it works in that environment. And so that, that they started seeing this thing of the flooding. At the same time in Japan, they were using, they, they still use uh, this paddy upland field rotation system. So they have rice and rice is flooded. And then after they grow rice, after a few years, they, they, uh, they drain the soil and so they go back. And they notice the same thing that when they, after that they flood the field, there were issues that they were not having anymore for a few years. So there was something interesting about floating. And now, uh, meanwhile, those are uh, primitive techniques, but um, at the same, like around the, the 70, 1970, um, in Israel and in California, they start developing the technique of the soil solarization. It is basically eating up the soil with using sunlight um, for a few weeks with soil that is moist, and this has uh, an effect, a sterilizing, sterilizing effect on the soil. And so this is a few picture. You can apply it on uh, the entire surface or just on the bed. And this also requires like at least four weeks and requires the achievement of certain temperature. And there is a combination of mechanism there. Now, growers um, and scientists were also, while they were testing flooding while they were testing soil solarization, they were also um, applying organic amendments. And uh, one interesting thing that the researcher that were working on both this technique saw was that when flooding or soil solarization was combined with organic amendments, then um, these two techniques, the efficacy of control against um, soil burn disease was higher. And so, um, this really led to led them to test more, you know, the combination of flooding and organic amendment, or the combination of soil solarization and organic. Amendment. And there is a lot of literature about this um, in the past, uh, I will say, 50 years, in the past 40 years. Um, but in the past, everybody was using metal bromide as um, as the solution for the soil disinfestation. This worked really great, it controlled everything. It was easy to apply, it was cheap, but then the metal bromide was phase out. <clears throat> and only when the metal bromide was phase out, those techniques were further developed. There was some interest for those techniques. And so researchers that were working on it since the, the 50s, they never, received attention, but after the phase out of metabromide, we went to look at what were our alternatives. And, and little by little, um, we developed uh, an aerobic soil disinfestation. So with the, the, after the Montreal and Kyoto protocol, with increasing concern about uh, human health and environmental sustainability, Shimura, which is a researcher from Japan, uh, he doing different experiment, um, combine the classical flooding with soil solarization and with organic amendment. And so he developed basically what we call an aerobic soil disinfestation or reductive soil disinfestation or biological soil disinfestation. Around the same years, the same thing happened in, in Netherlands. And something similar was happening also in Florida, where some nematologists were working on similar uh, techniques. 
um, so over the past, uh, I will say 20 years um, or 30 years, uh, there is a lot of people, a lot of researchers that have been working on this technique around the world. Um, currently, if we look at all the studies, uh, United States is the, the first place where we have like a higher number of researchers working on this technique. Um, but then uh, a lot of work has been done in Netherlands and Japan where everything started. And lately, in the last few years, I was in the last five years, um, these techniques start spreading also in other countries. So there's people working a lot in China on this, uh, in Mexico, in Spain, in Italy. There is a one study that was conducted in Argentina years ago, about 10 years ago. And, and all these researchers have been working on different crops, a really a wide range of crops, including not only vegetable, but also fruit crop. Um, and the, the ASD has been tested on soil bomb pathogen like Verticillium dahlia, Fusarium oxysporium, uh, Ralstonia solanaceum, which is a bacterial uh, disease, Rhizoctonia, sclero sclerotinia, um, and then nematodes, especially uh, root knot nematodes, so Melodogen incognita. Uh, and also, um, there have been studies done on uh, different weeds, including nutsedge, grasses, and broadleaf. So, really interesting work. Now, at commercial level today, we can say that uh, ASD is applied both in open field and greenhouse, and is applied in organic production system as well as in conventional farms. And um, from personal communication from MoMA, a researcher from Japan that has been working on this technique, um, it seems that in Japan, ASD is applied um, in, in a large part of the, of the country. So in 33 uh, prefectures out of 47, so which is a big area. Um, in Netherlands is applied, I believe, at least on uh, a few hundred acres. Um, and there is a company that is promoting, that has developed a system for to apply anaerobic soil disinfestation and is promoting uh, this technique. And then in US, we know um, is increasingly known um, this technique. And as it as we we study it more, and for sure there is a commercial application of of this technique in California and in Florida. Uh, in California, also, there is a company that uh, has been developing this system, proposing this system, taking it at commercial level uh, to the growers. And we know that there are about uh, 1,500 acres um, that are uh, treated with an anaerobic plantation. And because Mexico is close to California and a lot of farms are blend in both places, um, this is developing also in Mexico and then also in China and uh, in Europe. So here I, I have just a few pictures um, taken from some of the work that were published from Japan. And um, this showed the, the application of anaerobic soil disinfestation. In this case, combined with the soil solarization because they are using clear plastic. And this is how they applied it in open field and also in greenhouse. And uh, one thing is interesting is that in Japan, they have been applying this technique also to soilless system, so where they have uh, growing media that is used for more than a year, they've been using um, anaerobic soil disinfestation also to reset um, the, the growing media before they start a new crop. Um, so this is really interesting. And these are a few pictures of um, the application of anaerobic soil disinfestation in, uh, in China, where they use a different kind of a protected structure that are typical to China. And again, uh, we're talking about protected structure that are similar to our eye tunnels and also open field. And it seems that they are using, in many cases, um, <clears throat> clear plastic. Um, they have been using this technique, for example, on banana uh, for to control fusarium. And it seems that uh, they have been pretty successful. They call it reductive soil disinfestation. So it's, that's why RSD um, is the acronym. And then in California, uh, this technique has been applied a lot on strawberries um, and small berry, including uh, raspberry. Uh, there are 
a lot of companies using this technique. And uh, these are pictures from Farm, Farm Fuel Inch, which is uh, the company I mentioned before that in California developed this technique. And uh, they are using mainly rice bran as a carbon source, although they are uh, testing and proposing also other uh, carbon sources. And this is uh, from, from a, a communication we had um, uh, a couple of years ago. These were the, the data that they had on the acreage that they, uh, on which they were applying ASD. So they started around 2012 going at commercial level and that was um, they had treated uh, something like 130 acres overall with different crops and little by little they started increasing going up and in 2016 uh, they were at about uh, 1500 acres uh, so this is really interesting this trend and um, we know of course that california is an important uh, state for the production of vegetable fruit and uh, small fruit and and um, and so uh, potentially other state will follow uh, with this trend um, so now how we apply the anaerobic soil disinfestation. Usually ASD is applied in three steps. And these three steps are first, incorporating the soil readily decomposable organic material. The optimal carbon nitrogen ratio is about 30 to one. Um, there is a lot of work still that we need to do because it's not just about uh, carbon nitrogen ratio, but we'll talk about this uh, in the next, um, webinar in the next session. And why this is important? This is an important aspect because we, when we, we talk about carbon source, organic, the readily decomposable material, organic material, we are talking about sugar. So we need to provide a carbon source sugar that will activate uh, the, micro, the, the microbes in the soil. So that's our first step. And then what we do is we cover the soil with an oxygen impermeable tarp, with an oxygen impermeable film. So, uh, and this helps to create and maintain anaerobic condition and stimulate the anaerobic decomposition of the, of the organic material, the carbon source that we incorporated in the soil. And then what we do after that is we irrigate the soil to saturation. So this is, different from flooding the soil. We just saturate the, the top layer of the soil. And that means, for example, a few hours of water applied to drip irrigation. So we need the soil that is moist, but not, um, <clears throat> but not flooding. Um, and the purpose of this is to, uh, again, create an anaerobic condition, help to create an anaerobic condition, fill up all the airspace with water so that there is less oxygen. And then the irrigation also helps to um, diffuse within the, the, the root zone all the byproducts, all the, the, um, the organic compounds that we will see are produced during the anaerobic um, soil disinfestation. So um, that allows to have um, like a better uh, distribution of these compounds within the soil profile in the root zone. So I, I created a few slides. So assuming we have a soil and the soil can be uh, like different, what we do is we try to amend the soil with a labile carbon source and potentially also some organic carbon. And we really take care of the root zone, mainly of the root zone. Um, and after that we have amended the soil with an organic material, then we tarp it with mulch and usually what we do is to use totally impermeable film. Now, we can use also clear plastic. Um, so normally we will use, when we talk about ASD, we will talk about um, opaque film, film plastic. So it could be black or it could be white. Um, but may, in many cases, we are also using, as you saw in the picture, clear plastic. And in that case, we are kind of combining soil solarization with the ASD technique. And a lot, of the, a lot of people do that. The reason for doing that is because this is a microbial process, a biological process, and it's affected by temperature. And so um, basically 
with the clear plastic, we are in, we are able to increase the temperature of the soil, and there will be more microbial activity. The whole process is faster, and we may be able to achieve more anaerobic condition and have a higher efficacy um, in our treatment. So. After we apply the organic amendment, we mulch the soil with total impermeable film, and then we saturate um, the soil with water, normally by uh, drip irrigation or other method. And <clears throat> so what is happening here is that um, in, in a few hours, we are developing anaerobic condition. And um, usually we measure the anaerobic condition measuring the redox potential of the soil. And uh, we have defined like a threshold. Uh, some researchers have defined a threshold that um, basically below 200 millivolts of redox potential, we are basically under anaerobic condition. And so under anaerobic condition, there is a shift of the microbial population from aerobic micro microorganisms to uh, facultative and obligate anaerobic microbes. And what they do is they start decomposing the organic amendment, not uh, under aerobic, not with oxygen, but um, under anaerobic conditions. So we have what we call a fermentation process. And so when, because we have provided carbon, there's a lot of carbon that is readily available. So the organic carbon is transformed into sugar, the sugar is transformed into Rubic acid, and then through different microbes, um, through different process, we have the production of organic acids like acetic acid, lactic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid, formic acid. And then we have the development also of CO2, methane, and volatile organic compounds. And basically, these organic acids and some of the volatile organic compounds are suppressive for soil borne disease and soil borne pest. So this is the, the principle, the mechanism, um, the, the main mechanism. Then there are other factors. Now, we said also we are applying, when we apply organic amendment, we have also some nitrogen. So there is effect also on the nitrogen component of the organic material that we apply. And there are some transformation there. And so we can have also the formation of, um, ammonia and that could be part of uh, the, the the effect that anaerobic soil disinfestation has and we will talk more about this in the next um, uh, webinar um, so to to summarize our main hypothesis for the asd mechanism is that under anaerobic conditions the organic matter is decomposed by anaerobic microorganisms and they produce organic acids alcohols, ammonia, um, metal ions, and volatile organic compounds that are toxic or suppressive of several soil borne disease, including plant parasitic nematodes and weeds. Um, and one aspect that we should consider is that in the soil, we have kind of a shift from aerobic to anaerobic condition. And after we have anaerobic condition, it goes back to aerobic condition. And so really there is a lot going on in terms of microbial community and also in terms of um, how the, 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 the organic compounds, the organic matter is decomposed and the product that we have out of this um, decomposition. So um, we, we, we will try to understand this more next time. Um, and one thing is key is really the fact that ASD can be applied in different ways, but the, the, the main ingredient that um, can make the difference between different met, different approach to anaerobic soil disinfestation is the carbon source that we use. And there is different type of carbon source that have been tested and that are used in different environments. So for example, in Japan, they have been using a lot rice bran, wheat bran, and ethanol. So this is usually related to what is available locally so they have a lot of rice bran, they have a lot of wheat bran, but then they um, they also find out that ethanol was a good source. They don't have ethanol there, but they import it uh, from Brazil, for example, bioethanol. Um, in Netherlands, instead, they have been working more with grass, fresh grass, like the clippings, um, 
also re crop residues like potato homes or uh, brassica or other type of uh, fresh crop residues that incorporate in the soil can provide carbon to the microbes and uh, activate this uh, whole process. Um, in California, they have been using rice bran, wheat bran, and also some uh, mustard cake, um, seed cake, uh, mustard seed meal, almond sal, and, and um, I'm sure they are testing other things. They have been testing also molasses. Um, the approach um, that was developed in Florida is kind of a little bit different from the others, and I'm more familiar with this system because I was working there in the last four years. And um, in Florida, we, we, we have been using liquid molasses that is a byproduct of the sugar cane industry in combination with um, composted poultry litter. And we will see something about this in a few minutes. And then um, uh, um, my colleagues, uh, before I start working with them, uh, also tested some cover crop residues as a carbon source. So we tested several of those. Um, in Tennessee, uh, where there is one of the uh, researchers that has been more productive working on ASD, he also started working in Florida and then moved to Tennessee. Uh, he has been testing also the use of dry molasses and uh, over crop residues and also wheat bran. Um, so there is really a variety of approach. So for simplicity, I'm going to show you um, a little bit what we have done in Florida. Uh, to start with, uh, and um, so you will see this um, the uh, ASD applied to fresh market tomatoes. And uh, what we did was this was done in a research center, actually in two location. One was uh, Central Florida, and the other one was Southwest uh, Florida. And um, here we were testing ASD in comparison with chemical soil fumigation uh, done with uh, chloropic cysti which is uh, the, the standard treatment we could consider as the standard treatment. Um, and um, ASD was applied with two rate of molasses. So um, we had a base of nine tons of composted poultry litter and then two rates of molasses, 1,500 gallons and 3,000 gallons of molasses. So we call this treatment ASD1 and ASD2. This was done in the spring cycle, so starting in February, and our, the crop was harvested in June. And we were using an hybrid seepage drip irrigation system. And so very simply, what we did was we formed false bed, we applied the organic amendment, the composted poultry litter um, at the rate that we defined, and then we applied molasses. Now here you see me with the bucket, uh, and the molasses was diluted one to one with water, and we were applying it by hand because that was small pots. But really, there is different ways. You can inject the molasses, you can spray it on top of the bed. There is different solution that can be applied at commercial level and especially in a high tunnel. Um, after that, we applied the organic amendment. Everything is tilled in the soil in the top eight inches. And then uh, we laid the plastic, and this was TIF, total impermeable film, black on white, so the black was facing up. And, and then what you see here, all these wires were the sensors that we placed to, uh, to measure the, the anaerobic condition. So the treatment usually lasted three weeks. So after three weeks, we um, transplant the crop. We punch the plastic and transplant the crop. The, and here you can see um, the sensor that were used to monitor the redox potential. So those are um, um, particular sensors. And um, we, we just place them uh, within the, the root zone. And this is what we record with those sensors. Basically, in the graph here, you can see the black part here uh, is the, the conventional uh, treatment that didn't go anaerobic. And this line here is the 200 millivolts. That is our threshold. And both ASD treatment went way down here. Um, and so we had really good anaerobic condition. And this was for a few hours. So we're talking about a few days like this. And then little by little, the redox potential goes back to aerobic conditions. And, and so what we use to measure the efficacy of our treatment is 
the cumulative redox potential. And you can see here that increasing the rate of molasses, we had really higher anaerobic condition compared to um, the lower rate of molasses. And the control, the chemical fumigate control didn't go anaerobic at all. So this was really interesting. And so then we looked at what happened in terms of nematode control. We had very good nematode control. We had good, uh, pretty decent weed control. Um, if the infestation of like, let's say nut sedge or grasses is pretty high, if there is a lot of weed pressure, then ASD may be not the, the, the best solution or it, it may be effective to a certain extent, and then we have to combine it with something else. We also looked at the yield, and we saw that the yield was significantly higher in both ASD treatment compared to the chemical for fumigation, and there is a lot of reason for that. Um, and we also assessed the impact of the technique on the quality, and we find out that um, there was no really difference in terms of quality on the, on the, the tomatoes. And um, the only difference was that um, our the, the fruit treated with ASD were more firm than the one uh, treated with the chemical soil fumigation. And, and so this is like uh, briefly uh, I, to give you an idea of what we are talking about uh, with some picture. And uh, next time I would like to talk more about how we apply uh, this technique, how we can apply this technique in eye tunnels, especially here in the Northeast of United States, um, what are the, the alternative carbon sources and how we choose the carbon sources, what type, if cover crop can be um, a carbon source, what are the characteristics that they should have, what organic amendments we can use as a carbon source or as supplementary carbon source to the carbon source. And then it's really important to define what is the window, the optimal window that we have uh, to apply SD in uh, high tunnel production system here in the Northeast and what is the application then? Uh, I think I, I uh, went over my time and um, really if uh, I'm done with this and if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. And thank you for... Thank you. Um, while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, um, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you for preparing this and sharing. It's a lot of great information. Thank you for the, this opportunity. And uh, yeah, I look forward um, to continue this discussion next week.